G'day punters, Nick Quinn here and welcome to Tabs Inside 50. As per usual, the man that takes this podcast in all sorts of wonderful directions, Shane Crawford. Hello Nicholas, uh, lovely to join you. Very special guest today. Do you want me to introduce him? No, I'll do that as per <laughs> usual. Thank you Shane. You just stick to the righty instructions. We had lots of great feedback last week after your love for carpet was unveiled on the podcast. But this week, it's all about this man. Thompson, best efforts, not enough. Had to take the body. Garland goes to the wing, driving quick, had a quick look forward, did Kennedy Harris into the middle oh, now. There's demons everywhere. They're steaming forward. Tyson took his time. He has to kick the goal. He knew it. He's done it. Demons are light. All class, a man who played for GWS Melbourne and North Melbourne, Dom Tyson, welcome to the podcast. Quinny Croft, thanks for having me. Good to be here. And I've only heard the audio of that highlight, and maybe I didn't have many highlights because I know exact goal that that's <laughs> referring to. So, Who was it against? Uh, Gold Coast Suns, round one, 2015. Spot on. Now, I was going to show or going to play your first goal for Melbourne against St Kilda because it was absolutely beautiful. It was from outside 50 on the left foot, but Brian Taylor ruined it. He said, and Dom Tyson, he's standing there and saying, how good am I? And I'm like, we can't play that as the intro. So he didn't pump you up enough. <laughs> well, he, he called me Tom Dyson a few times yeah. on the coverage. So if he's got the name right, I'll take that. No, I don't think he did, actually. I yeah. think that was another reason. But that was a lovely goal. And it was exciting to start the show. And you seem to start each season with a nice goal as well for the Ds. Yeah, we had a few good starts the year de- uh, at Melbourne there. We, we didn't probably kick on as much as we should have early days when I was involved. But um, they are flying right now at five and zip and look like the team to beat. And when we had this guest listed this week and you said he was a really classy player and one you're looking forward to having a chat to, Croft. Very good skills. And I know his dad. His dad was, uh, well, he is Deodora, you know, when you think of Deodora in Australia. So I've known Dom for a very long time and it's good to see he's wearing his Deodoras and no doubt he's brought you and I a a box of shoes, Quinny, which is fantastic. I'm sure you've got them here, haven't you, Dom? Oh, the car's a fair bit parked away, (laughs) Croft, so I'll have to see what I can do afterwards. But But, uh, really good mate of uh, Peter Swab, a former Hawthorne coach, and uh, he used to virtually be a mentor and a real support for Peter Swab during his coaching days. And uh, trust me, for a couple of years at the Hawks, he he needed some good mentors because we weren't very good there for a while. But uh, a a super player, yeah, very, very skilled. And uh, he's been on the the football merry-go-round, which which happens. Now, we're going to talk about your footy career as well, but we're going to start by going down a left field sort of course, and course is the appropriate term, because you're very well dressed. You look dapper, and that's something that your new business is going to go down, making young golfers look trendy. Yeah, I do have a golf apparel business, um, and I'm wearing the kit today, and it's it's miserable outside, so I'm not actually playing golf afterwards. I thought I'd come in and show it off, um, and it does stem a bit from the old man who does have a bit of a background in sporting manufacturing and distribution of sporting goods, so I've sort of tapped into a bit of his networks and resources, and created my own brand called Clutch & Co. So it's getting there. We're online, do a little bit of wholesale, um, but I enjoy it and, and trying to really grow it right now. Did you pick the brains of Jack Watts? He's got squash going beautifully. Did you say what works, what doesn't work? <laughs> yeah, well, he's a bit of a trailblazer, Wattsy, for good and the bad, and we love him. <laughs> um, he, he He's great. He's, I do tap into him and his business partner, Adam Walsh, who I'm sure you know. And um, it's funny because... What's he would rope us in, not rope us in because we loved it, but he'd host these big parties at Reva, <laughs> which um, there wasn't a product on sale. It was more of a service. So um, he did a great job in that, yeah, back in the day there. And the great thing about Watsy is, like, he had to put himself first, you know, and, and put himself out there because when he had a little bit of controversy, it was all because of the brand. He wanted to make sure the brand got a bit more awareness. And that's why he went down that track, wasn't it, Quinny? A good mate of yours? Yeah. Uh, Wish he probably had a thought of that defence at the time there, Shane. <laughs> but no, it's good to we see. We have the, had him on the podcast, yeah, though, yeah. Of, what, what, It's guerrilla marketing, isn't it? That's it the is, tactic, yeah. yeah. No. So all about driving traffic. you think a bit traffic. differently, and he was yeah. definitely thinking differently back then. <laughs> yeah. But in a good space yeah. now. Yeah. Before yeah. we get onto the footy and yeah. get Watsy out of trouble, yeah. for those that want to get involved with your golfing apparel, who does yeah. it appeal to and what was behind it? Yeah, well, we tried to penetrate the market at a bit of a lower pricing strategy. We thought... Um, Pretty expensive to start golf, clubs, membership, then there's apparel, footwear, all sorts of equipment, all that. So um, I've just come in with some versatile products where you can probably wear them at a podcast in the afternoon and then get away with it and then go out to the course and, and feel good and comfortable. And we've got a lot of stretch fabrics through the materials, so it will move with your body and a little bit of a tapered fit through some of them. So that probably appeals to the younger 
demographic, but we've had good feedback from the older demographic as well. And what I find is most footy players love either racing, golf, or both. There would have been lots of Hawks players that were in that bracket. Yeah, well, there's lots of uh, lots of golfers in the AFL world. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, at Hawthorne it was very much uh, you know a weekly thing. I couldn't understand how you can find a full day pretty much to go and play golf. Um, but, you know, they found a way and they kept their handicaps nice and low, um, which was good. But I'm a left-hander. I've got a snap hook. Um, I need to drag my opponents down, who I'm playing with. Verbally. Um, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, heckling is a must, and if you can't handle it, I can't play with you. How's your golf going? No doubt oh. your injuries have paid its price there with the golf. Can you hit a yeah. driver yet? Oh, yeah. I, I think I've said it before, but for a guy with a golf brand, I've got to be a lot better than what I, what I produce. I'm off about 16. I'm still hitting a five-iron off the tee into the wind, par five. So... Yeah, I've got some room to improve. I, I think the best golfer at Hawthorne at the moment is Mitch Lewis. I think he's off mm. like a... I've seen his swing on Instagram. Tool. It's yeah, yeah. beautiful. I think he plays down at Peninsula Kingswood. He looks like he's right up there. Yeah, he's, he's a bit of a natural. But yeah. it, it's amazing, those footballers, and then they get, get on a golf course, and you'd think doing weights and doing things differently that you have to do to train and prepare for football, and then they have these beautiful swings. And then I'll tell you what, some of the big boys can really... Rip it off the tee, mm. and it can go a long, long way. I remember back in my day, Nathan Thompson, even Ben Dixon, he had, well, I'd call it illegal, this club, because it had <laughs> holes in it and it wasn't. But the ball used to go forever. <laughs> I'm sure he couldn't use it in a tournament. Yeah. Who's yeah. the best golfer you've seen at the footy club? Uh, best, Oscar McDonald. Um, he's off scratch or even plus one now. So I played oh. with him one day. He shot 69 at Royal Melbourne East. Oh, wow. wow. And we played with the pro. <laughs> and he beat the pro off the stick, which is a little bit, yeah. Gee. Um, and then Watsy hits a nice ball when he's up and going. Um, well, Sean Higgins hits a nice ball. He takes it very seriously, too seriously. And then, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, let me think, Melbourne days. Um, Jaden Hunt's pretty good. Adam Tomlinson. A- Angus Brayshaw loves his golf, so yep. he's... He's not an ambassador at Royal Melbourne, but he might as well be. He, he, yeah, talks about it very frequently. <laughs> yes, he likes reminding anyone that he beats in golf how he beat them. And hey, uh, I must admit, my last round of golf, yeah. I actually won. I won the tournament, <laughs> so uh, I don't want to talk, make it all about me. But I, yeah. I, I played with Dermot Brereton, Dipper, and we played in the World um, Cup golf yeah. tournament, and uh, they threw me in. But we also had the pro at the time, and he was from Denmark. I can't think of his name, but anyway, in the top 10 or top 20. And it was virtually just the team score. And, of course, we won because he was in super form. I, I'd never played so bad in my life. And we had crowds. We had crowds. So off the tee, I, was, I swear I was going to kill someone off the tee because of my snap hook. So I'm asking, oh, can you please sort of lean back a bit? And I thought I was going to put him totally off his tournament because the next day they're going to start the proper tournament. Anyway, we ended up winning. Wow. Well. I got this amazing golf bag. Uh, Dermot said, "Whatever you do, don't get up and accept it because the way you play today, there's no way you can accept anything." <laughs> and then the guy went on to win the the pairs World Cup Championship the next few days. So my preparation really helped him. Yeah, I want I've to got this, who that was. Um, yeah, let's get a name there. <laughs> yeah, Denmark. Um, That's not Alex Norin. Is, no, no, no. Uh, uh, they, they, they had the same name, the same first name. I know that um, the two uh, Denmark boys. But how long ago was this? This is only a few years ago. Um, was it at Royal, Royal Melbourne? I think it was. Yeah, yeah, because I I chopped that course up yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but you should see this. I, I've got all the gear and absolutely no idea. Seriously, I've got this amazing bag. So if you want to intimidate anyone, you walk in with this bag. I've even got my backpack, which I've got with me today because I'm I'm jumping on a plane. And it's got World Championship of Golf. So it looks like, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> and you open it up. And I'm a left-hander, right? But I can't putt left-handed. I get so shaky. So I've got a right-handed putter. Right. So you open up my clubs and everyone goes, what's going on here? And it's got a huge arc in it because I did wrap it around a tree. <laughs> but I still use it and it seems to work okay. So there's a few issues there. Anyway, yeah. Dom, we'll go and have a hit one day. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> what a great start to this <laughs> podcast this has been. Now let's maybe I'm break think it up of his name. by talking yeah. some footy. And we'll start with Dom's junior career. You started your career, obviously, as a star from day dot. You played under 12s for Victoria and went on to play for the Oakley Chargers where you'd be made captain one day. Footy was something you are obviously very good at from a young age. Yeah, just love sport, Quinny. So footy, basketball, cricket, golf, tennis, swimming, everything, just have a crack. And footy was the one that always I was drawn to, passion for. And um, 
I guess, yeah, you, you don't really know you're good. I guess as you go through the ranks, you sort of keep making teams and you might win a BNF here and there and think, all right, I might be all right at this. But probably wasn't until I was sort of 16, 17 where I thought I actually had a chance of getting drafted and um, time to make a few sacrifices if that's what I wanted to pursue. Now, in that under-12 Victorian team, were there any other players that went on to oh, make it? There's a, there's a good photo of all of us and a, I think Caroline <laughs> Wilson did a Where Are They Now? Um Dylan yeah. Shield, yep. Dev Smith, um, Tomlinson, um, I'm forgetting some guns. There's probably about 11 that end up playing. Wow. Michael Talia. Um, Jeez. Yeah. Oh, Cause it, oh, wish oh, I had the photo. Like, oh, we wish we had the golfer's name. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get the name, don't worry. Yeah. Um, but the, um, it, it's amazing that, like, even at the age of 12, that so many from that team go on to play AFL mm. football because also everyone develops – Differently, so you play. Was it? Did you play with Glen Iris? No, what? No, nah, Campbell Sharks. You were a yeah. Sharks, yeah. Because yeah. there's a few players that have come from around that area. Ash Burton was the one. So Ash we Burton. we played a team that had Jack Viney, Tom Mitchell, and Toby Green for Ash right. Burton in yes. an under 15s prelim. So it was a fair midfield Ooh. that they were rolling out with, and um, <laughs> we actually got the chockies. Did you? Yeah. Then we then we. Oh, got do you know gone. what? They would have played for themselves. They were a bit selfish. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that stat padding the boys. So. Um, no, and then, yeah, there was a Fitzroy team that had you know, Dill Buckley and um, Hal Hunter, who was on a list for a few years, and a few other guys. So they were, they were a pretty good side. Now, as you were coming through, it probably became clear there was a good chance you were going, going to go on and play AFL footy. And at that time, there were two new teams coming in, Gold Coast and GWS. At what stage did you think, hang on, yes, I might play AFL footy, and mm, I might be going to one of these new franchises? Oh, it wasn't until late in the year, because I, I wasn't really predicted as a high pick from all those mock drafts they do from the outset. But um, I sort of had a good carnival for Vic Metro, went back at school level in Oakley, and we reached the granny and um, had a good final series and played well in that AGSV school game that all the recruiters love to talk about. And they always pluck one or two from that game that hasn't played Tac Cup. And um, Giants, I think, might have had eight of the top ten picks. So once I thought, oh, I'm getting touted as a top three, top five, if that gets pushed out to somewhere in the top ten, I'm still looking like it's an 80% chance I'll be heading up to the Giants. And then draft camp, you get interviewed, you get your schedule of which clubs are interviewing you, and I think I only had the Giants and Port Adelaide, which had pick six, it might have been Wingard. So that was my only two I sort of spoke to at any length. So I thought I'm a fair chance here. It's it's the Giants in one of those top five picks. And how did that sit with you? I was excited. I mean, as Crawford know, when you go, you just want to play footy. So wherever the opportunity comes, you just you're just craving putting on a jumper at AFL level and, and seeing if you can mit- match it and, and play. And even when you're young, your first goal is, can I just play a game? So um, wherever that may be, that's that's where I was keen to pursue. And they had 11 of the first 14 draft picks, as you alluded to. You were pick three. Some of the other players, Jonathan Patton was pick one, Caniglio pick two, Hoskin Elliott pick four, and Toby Green pick 11. It was very unique, Crawford, wasn't it? They started a team from absolute scratch, and they did the right way. They went to the draft, and they didn't probably do what – Gold Coast had done and got too many players that were okay at senior level. They said, no, we're going to start from fresh, do it the tough way, but for a long-term gain. Yeah, and did you have a team? Who did you support? Is I was Richmond. Oh, you are the Tiger. Yeah. Did you say that earlier? No. No, not yet. Oh, yeah, right, so it's it's a hard one if you're back for a Melbourne side yeah. and then you're heading off to Sydney, so you're leaving your family, which I know you've got a, a great connection with your family, but... You're in with all the youngsters. Mm, that's right. So good times ahead. So you Social go and times, learn, Sydney, yeah, so. learn how to train. Yeah. Um, you, you're all in the same boat because you're coming from all walks of life, but a lot of you are coming from Melbourne. And, yeah, it's, it would have been a lot of fun as well. It was. Yeah, it's If you're going to get dropped anywhere as an 18-year-old into a different part of Australia, Sydney's a pretty good place. So we sort of got set up in this sort of – not a community. Well, like it had its own postcode, Breakfast Point, and they sort of it was a bit more of a retirement village. That's yes, that's what it yep. was, and they dropped about 35, 18 year olds in some shared housing <laughs> in there, and um, we ruffled a few feathers. There was a few houses that had to get moved around for noise complaints and combinations they worked through with different lads with different boys. But uh, great fun. You're sort of driving to training together. You're training hard. Um, then you're out for dinner together and you're playing together and. Um, it's like boarding school. Oh yeah, it felt like it. It did. Yep. Well, not that I went to a boarding school, but it did feel like an under 18s camp when you're, you know, mm. travelling at state level, things like that. And then you got someone like Kevin Sheedy involved in the footy club, so you've got someone with so much experience, and he knew you probably weren't going to win many games, um, but it was all about the way that you went about it. So having someone with that experience, and I think he 
seemed like he was having the time of his life as yeah. well. Wow, he, he had a lot of red wines for Sheeds up at the <laughs> local pub at the Palace there. Um, he was a bit more of a figurehead. And guess so what? It would have had a tab too. Don't you there worry was. about that. Yeah, there was. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he was a bit more of a figurehead. So we didn't actually see a heap of him early days because he was trying to grow the brand and implement, yep. you know, integrate footy, integrate OS and Sydney, the actual place. So, um, yeah, we didn't see a heap of him. But he, the club, as you alluded to, they were great because they sort of set us up as a development team, not a win-loss team in that first year or two. So I remember we'd sort of maybe got rolled by 60 or 70 some weeks, but they really pumped us up as though we'd won and keep backing yourselves in, boys. You're drafted for a reason, show your attributes. So you were never too flat after a loss up there. What were some of the other things the club did well? Because it seems like they set the foundation really strongly. They did, yeah. They Well, they recruited really well, um, and they kept on going back to the draft and just loading up uh, on Melbourne players, which gave them greater capacity when those Melbourne players wanted to go home. You're dealing with 10 teams, not two back in Adelaide or wherever, back in Perth too. So they had, could probably get more draft assets through trade back with um, teams in Melbourne. And then they recruited young guys like Wardy and Phil Davis and a couple of others that were going to be there for the journey. So they were only 21, 22 when they got picked up. So they were going to hit their prime at a similar time as to all that first batch of 18-year-olds were going to hit their prime. So they timed it well. Um, yeah, good part of Sydney. So I think retention helped a little bit with how much all the boys loved living in Sydney. Now, round one, you make your debut against the Sydney Swans in front of a big crowd. And to sum up how lopsided this contest was expected to be, the line for the game was 88.5 points. Ooh. The Giants were a $26 outsider, but you were very competitive. What was it like that first day? You came off as a sub with sub. 10 touches. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did say, oh, well, you'll never be sub two weeks in a row because we'll use it as a way of rotating the younger players through the mm-hmm. season. Lo and behold, first two games I was sub, so they threw, the, <laughs> threw that one out the window quick. But yeah, I was. I mean, to debut it was great, but then I remember it wasn't until the captain's run I sort of got the tap on the shoulder from Choco Williams said, oh mate, we'll head you in as sub this week. So you're sort of like, I mean, I'm pretty excited to play, but you don't know when you're actually going to get on. Yep. At those days, it was just a sub that was, it wasn't medical. So you were you know, likely to get on for a quarter. So I did get on, I think, for the last quarter and got a run around. The game was pretty much dead, so I could sort of just run around and try and get involved and get my hands on it and do a few things. And then the next week, I was actually sub again round two and I had this back spasm the day of the game. And I should have said something because I couldn't touch my toes and we're down in Hobart and, you know, I just didn't know if, yep. what it would all mean if I'd pulled out of the game. So I played, but I could... Be, lucky I didn't have to play a full game. I wouldn't have been able to get, get through and... um I think I only had a couple of touches and I was I was out for the next, you know, four to six weeks with a, a bulging disc in my back. How did you do that? I don't know. I remember the day of the game, I woke up down in Hobart and I went, oh, something's not right. And then I thought it'd warm up and it'd loosen up and I didn't even know what to do about painkillers or <laughs> anything like that, which when you learn later in career, you, you know, anti inflams and some neurofins and some things might help you. But um, I, I didn't even trial that. I, didn't, I just sort of thought, oh, this will never happen before. I'll get going and... It, it didn't loosen up at all. Now he's grinning. He's your, yeah. about to mention his favourite kind of painkiller, the silver bullet. Oh, the silver bullet where you can put up your backside. And you probably <laughs> never had to do that one. But I do no, recommend I it if you do want to touch your toes <laughs> when you're playing footy because it's important to pick the ball up off the ground. Um, no, but that's definitely a bulldog yeah, a trick um, that was passed down to Hawthorne. And, yeah, I think a lot of people have been using it for a long time. Maybe it's gone out. I don't know. But the first time I did it, I didn't take the silver wrapping off, which didn't work as well as I wanted it to, Quinny. Um, now, Dom, so how do you go playing in, through your juniors and, and doing really well and, and playing in, in good sides and yeah. sides that would win a lot to knowing that our fitness level's not there, we're a development side, we're probably not going to win. Um, how, do, how did you mentally attack that? And I want to be a part of this team and get into the team too, mm. so... It's it's a different headspace you have to go to. Definitely, yeah. It's a bit of a whirlwind. So I think, you know, first of all, you're just happy to get a game. And then when you're young, you're probably not even thinking big picture, are you? You're sort of just, how can I play well? How can I keep my spot? So often that was probably your mindset heading into the game. Just, you know, show what you can do, have a crack. And you play with a bit of freedom. So sometimes it actually works well where you, you know, you're, you're not thinking big picture. You're just right there in the moment lot of freedom don't care about the mistakes you're making off you go no real consequences so they did set you up well there where they um yeah they said look you'll probably a lot of those young guys you'll, you'll get 10 games into you that you might not have played if you're at another established team sheeds was pretty big about that he'd sort of um suggested he liked guys to do a 30 to 40 game apprenticeship in the vfl then they'd play 
yep. um, and we were sort of getting our apprenticeship in the AFL. So we sort of were pretty appreciative of that, that we could grow and develop actually playing AFL footy. After two years at GWS playing 13 games, you decided to head back to Victoria. There was interest from Richmond. What led you to go to Melbourne and what led to you making the move? Yeah, well, I did. Re- uh, I met Richmond after my first year, which um, you, you get drafted on an AFL contract for two years. Um, so I didn't know if that was realistic, but I still met them and we sort of talked about a few things. But I think they might have been planting the seed for the next year mainly. Did you talk about your love for them? Well, they, they knew, yeah, they did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said to me at one point, oh, who's your favourite player? And I said, oh, growing up, it was Matthew Richardson. I loved him. And then they said, oh, we can give him a call and put you guys in touch right now. And I oh, don't yeah. have to do that, but <laughs> appreciate the offer. And um, It's a hard one. And, like, it's, it's amazing, even back when you were first interviewed from the Giants and also Port Adelaide, um, I think what happened a few years later is that all those, because of the planning around, you know, a lot of the Melbourne boys, we'll get them back eventually, hopefully. Yeah. Um, a lot of the clubs started to go, hey, we want to meet with you. And then, yep, we probably can't get you, but hey, if you ever want to come back, this is what we're about. So they start yeah. virtually presenting. A bit of grooming. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, this is our amazing footy club. Yeah. Seven years before you come, you yeah. know. So in the back of your mind, it, it must be really difficult as a young kid because yeah. it gives you, you know, so many options. Yeah, especially if you want to come back to Melbourne and be involved in the Melbourne football scene, which we all know is pretty bloody crazy. Yeah, yeah, you're spot on. I th- well, even how it came about with the actual Melbourne trade, because I did, my, I had a PCL, MCL Rico in my second year at the Giants, so I didn't play much footy, um, and I'd signed a two-year contract just for a bit of security, and you know, I wanted, still wanted to play some footy up there and and show my worth up there. Um, and then I remember I was in Hawaii for another teammate. Satano Helfman was getting married in Hawaii. He was a teammate at the Giants. So about eight or ten of us got the invite and we thought we'd better get over there and support the big fella. And we're <laughs> over there. And um, it was towards the back end of the trade period. And I was with Taylor Adams. And he was trying desperately to get to Collingwood. And it hadn't happened yet. Um, and I remember I got a phone call from Paul Ruse. And he, he sort of, um, first of all, said, oh, you're in Hawaii. You know, I've spent, you know, he's partners from Hawaii and what are you doing? Diamond Bay and all these sort of hot yeah, spots. Yeah, and yeah. he goes, oh, mate, just touch and base. Thought I'd ring you and get your opinion on a few players. And I thought, oh, it's a bit strange. Yeah, right. And then, you know, he rounded out the conversation with, look, mate, what about you? Where are you at? And I sort of didn't know what what was happening with all that phone call. And then it wasn't until I you know, was flying back to Melbourne in a couple of days and my manager said, oh, look, mate, Melbourne are pretty keen. It's it's definitely worth going for a meeting trade period's got a day or two left it's it can happen if you really wanted it to so I sort of went to Todd Viney's house and Rusey was obviously there and how's was, how was Hawaii mate was it good <laughs> <laughs> I was like yeah we did a few of the things you suggested it was great thanks for that and then um yeah I just pulled the trigger on it pretty much straight after it felt right and didn't yep. overthink it and I was there you know day or two later in the media and off you go and, and what about the other pl- so you said he was arcu- asking about other players yeah. was he asking generally about other players as well well that was what do you think of this guy what yeah i remember guy? he asked three or four guys that were and up you at the didn't Giants. know him very well no, no not at all no, no no so it's a bit hard to open up when you go yeah i didn't know his angle i thought it what's sort of this thought, guy like and you're like oh, yeah. okay oh you know he's okay you're not gonna bag anyone that's right yeah i remember thinking, unless you're quinny yeah that's what quinny does <laughs> he pots you he'd rat them out behind you back all the time 100 yeah, percent. yeah. <laughs> yeah no i, I didn't drive I by after. there for no reason yeah. carry on <laughs> No, I can't. I can't even remember the three or four. I remember one of them. He did ask, you know, how's Taylor Adams going? And I was like, oh yeah, I think he's going well, mate. Like he's having a few beers and keen to get to Collingwood, sort of thing. And we got a wedding tomorrow and things like that. But it, I can't remember the other three or four. But I just remember yeah. it being about a five, just ten minute phone call. And the last question was, and yeah, mate, just touching base. How are you tracking? Where are you at with everything? And how's your body and everything like that? So he sort of rounded it out with. Uh, I think the, the, the question so, you want I'm to I'm just on the, uh, I'm at the nightclub on the podium at the moment, actually. My knee's feeling pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pina colada, whatever you're drinking <laughs> over there. So. Yeah, so that's how that one came about. And it was, oh, look, I'm glad it did because I, I had a good run there for about five years and really enjoyed it. How did the exit go from GWS? Yeah, amicable. Um, I called, the first person I called was Luke Power, who was playing still. He just finished up and he was a bit of a mentor for me and he sort of still is actually and just touch base a bit. Um, and I just said to him, like, mate, look, there's an offer there. It sounds like it's going to happen if I, say, give it the green light. And then Lukey just said, mate, look, if it's what you want to do and you're going to back yourself in, just do it. And no hard feelings from the club. Like, they're prepared for the fact they're going to lose, a, you know, a handful. They've got a 15, 18-year-olds that want to play inside mid or midfield and they know their numbers don't work. So if you're going to be the first – the thing was I was about the first one 
of those early guys to go, along with Tay went that year as well, but we were sort of the first guys that pulled the trigger and left. And so you get to Melbourne, Paul Roos has arrived, it's been a dismal period for the club, but it's starting to trend in the right direction. Yep. You had a magnificent first year for the D's in 2014, runner-up in the club best and fairest by Nathan Jones, 11 Brownlow votes, you hit the ground running. Yeah, it was a good year, um, personally, we didn't win too many games as a team, but yeah, it's just funny, I guess. Looking back on it, Rusey backed me in. I was a bit underdone. I wasn't super fit. Uh, and I was the starting midfielder for round one. And he gave me a few weeks to find my feet. And I sort of hit a groove after that. And, um, yeah, just just felt like timing and opportunity all matched up. And and then I sort of backed it up a little bit with some, some yeah, uh, consistent performances. What was the biggest difference between playing for Melbourne and playing for GWS? Oh, at the time, I remember um, getting into the building and I was blown away that there was volunteers. Like There was, you know, six to eight people that were just trainers that I'm sure they weren't getting paid and property assistance and boots. You're and talking about Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, Melbourne, because yep. Giants was yep. obviously such a new club and just hadn't set up any fan base at that point or any history because they didn't have any, obviously. So when I got to Melbourne, it was an old club, historic club, and I remember going, geez, what are they, these guys doing at training? They're collecting the balls and putting cones out and then they're offering to clean your boots, fill up your drink bottle and things like that, and washing your towels in at the club and things like that. And <laughs> I, was, that, I remember that hit me. I was like, geez, this, these guys are keen. This is pretty good. And then, um, yeah, the the difference, um, obviously there were senior players. Like the majority of the team was senior players. So I got to Melbourne and actually sort of felt young. So I felt like um, I was a young player, which I didn't feel like at the Giants. It just felt like you were one of the many. So you were probably there when you watched probably Max Gorn emerge correct so you got to see probably uh, on the seesaw down and yeah. then you saw on the way up definitely yeah which he would was, have been pretty special to witness yeah well i've got well two stories i do remember about gorney early days was when i got there um they presented him with the previous year's runner-up best and ferris at casey um which was must have been 2013 he must have won that um and in his little speech he did in front of the boys he goes yeah look i've only i've only played you know, I think he was in and out of the teams. He goes, I only, I've only played 10 games and I've got second in the VNF. Imagine if I played the full year. Um, <laughs> and then the winner of that best and fairest they presented to was Jesse Hogan. He wasn't eligible for AFL that year. He's still that 17-year-old right, that got yep. picked up early. And I remember he had his little trophy in his hand and he sort of just pointed at Gorney. He goes, well, you can just win it this year, Gorney. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, and then the second one, I remember... Talking about being a sub, Gorney, I remember he, uh, there was a contest um, and he was, I must have against, it might have been against Frio up in Darwin early on and he was still in and out of the team, but you could see some, like he was starting to dominate VFL if he dropped back. Like he was marking everything, kicking goals and yeah, you could just tell and then, but he hadn't quite had a breakout game yet at AFL level. And I remember at half time, um, he was on a mismatch with a, you know, a mid-sized player from Frio and he, he didn't outmark, he got outmarked. And Ruzi subbed him out of the game. And I sort of went, you know, Ruzi gave him a little drive-by, similar to what Croft's just done to you, Quinny, a couple of minutes ago. But it was something like, <laughs> Jesus, you know, Gorney, you any danger of using your size sort of thing. Like, and that was him subbed out. And then it wasn't until that 2015 year, I, I think he burst out on the scene, all Australian, dominating games. His marking was just unbelievable. And then I think since then, he's just about been all Australian every year and yeah, he looks like another midfielder, even though he's 280 centimetres. He does, centimeters. he moves yeah. unbelievably well, Kicking goals, he? that prelim was unbelievable. Yep. So, yeah, he, he was one that jumped out straight away. Yeah, it's pretty special to watch, you know, players sort of, you know, have that moment where something flicks in their mind and, okay, yep, yeah, right, this is what I need to do. And then all of a sudden you can see that emergence. And, yeah, you know, he's going to go down in history as... You know, that Melbourne captain who, who led the way. Definitely. And it's very much against the mould when you think of Melbourne and yeah. traditionally what Melbourne was all about. And he's also got a, I mean, media-wise, he's got a great personality for the media. He's, you know, gives a plenty. He's got some great banner and um, he's built a really good brand for himself as well. Yes, I'd like to be a dollar behind him post-football, that is for sure. <laughs> now, you get to Melbourne. It's a great club that has had a anything but great run. Paul Ruse arrives, people are starting to feel up and about. What was the mood from some of the senior players? Did you have much to do with the likes of Nathan Jones? And what did they have to say about the last few years before you arrived? Good question. Uh, we did have those, you know, leading teams type meetings where there was someone from leading teams facilitating it. And we sort of tried to put to bed all that past, um, you know, three to four years of 
really poor results and then start afresh, new era. Um, they would have been terrible meetings. Like, oh, they, they were shocking. Like, I was involved with a football club that struggled and you have leading teams in all these honesty sessions. It's not good. Oh, it's, they, it's not they good. They just drag, don't especially they? Especially when... You know, because you, you look at so many things um, and it just it, it drags out and it can go forever. Yeah. So being in Melbourne's position when they're going through that, which you were, um, yeah, mentally it can really get to you. It's like, just give us a clean slate. Yeah. Let's start again and away we go. We've got a new coach. Let's just go. Spot on. Like the, I remember, you know, Butch's paper session where it's um, <laughs> how do other clubs perceive us right now? And then you'd be in small groups and you'd have to write up. You know, we're a basket case, we're shit house, um, non competitive, an easy win. <laughs> and and they, then, they would have come to you too, coming from a different club as well. It's like, hey, what, what did the Giants think yeah, of us? Yeah. So you've got to be a bit guarded as well, going, well, they think they're terrible. Oh, you're dangerous on your day. <laughs> 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 but you say stuff like that. And then, you know, I'll, if there was a newspaper article about us mid year, what would we want the headline to be? So it was all those sort of things that were. You know, well, it's all pretty airy fairy stuff. There's not much sort of substance behind it at this stage because we haven't done anything to make any inroads. So we did plenty of those. Um, Bruzy was big on it because I think that helped set the culture up at Sydney. So we couldn't dodge those sessions. It was, you know, if it, and we never had like a time limit. I remember it'd be, this is going to take as long as it takes. We could be in here for 20 minutes or four hours. We need the input from you guys as players and we'll get out of it what you put in. So don't just sit on your, you know, sit on your heels and sit on your hands, yep. say something and Speak do all that. Up. So we did plenty of those activities. Um, but the feeling from the senior guys, I think they were just excited because Daniel Cross had come across, come across, sorry, word play on words there. He joined the club. Bernie Vinch joined the club. Um, Hogan was starting to come through now as an eligible player after his year. Uh, it had a decent... Tr- Jack Viney was in his second or third year by this stage. So there was a little bit... Enough to keep you um, positive around the place, but um, you could tell they were pretty keen for things to turn very quickly. Now, the next few seasons, you played really well. We had some injuries. We'll get to them in a sec. But for the team, it was almost one step forward, two steps back. Spot on, yeah. We, we had a good uh, 2016... I think we missed... The, was that the year we missed the finals by the... That might have been 2017, like the record smallest amount of percentage. So we were thereabouts. Like we'd sort of um, win that game where we'd be interstate against the top eight side and we might beat West Coast over there. It was, a, oh, this is a... We're away. And then we might go back and lose to Carlton at the G who weren't going too well at the time. So we are a little bit unpredictable and not super consistent. But um, once Goody came aboard as a senior assistant, we sort of started seeing his brand of footy come through and um, slowly but surely we could sort of see um, why we were winning games, why we were losing, where the intensity needed to be and we started to get a feel. Clayton Oliver was there now, Petraka, Angus Brayshaw, those type of guys were first or second years and you could sort of really see that this is going to take shape. Unfortunately, I wasn't there when it did take shape mm. but um, yeah, they uh, there was the bones were there for sure. And could you see, so Paul Roos coaching, but Simon Goodwin comes in uh, underneath, but he was obviously allowed to try and mould it with where he wanted to go with the future, whereas Paul Roos just oversaw everything and made sure that everything's sort of aligning the way they want it to and the direction was up. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, Roosy was definitely hands-on that first year or two, but once Goody came in, he sort of took a back seat, allowed Goody to... um, start implementing the, you know, we, we brought in contest and Ruzi was big on defence. So Goody brought in an offensive model backed up by contest. So Isn't it amazing Paul Ruse was big on defence, yet he never manned up in his whole career? He was an amazing interceptor. Wasn't he defender, a loose but he, I didn't see him play. He never had an opponent. <laughs> yeah. He, they, they used to call him the eight-time spare de- eight time All-Australian spare <laughs> defender or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, like so. yeah. He's definitely yeah. All-Australian defender. Yeah. Like, hang on, he didn't have an opponent yeah. that year. We <laughs> had he him in here and he's <laughs> Crawfast two things he didn't appreciate. One was that, and the other was quizzing him about getting the off at the Carlton job. You've oh, never right. seen a bloke re- retreat more quickly. Uh, well, you could ask these questions, but yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I agree with me, who's a great player. Always, you know, had plenty of run and set up really well but yeah. I still can't remember who we played on <laughs> too smart for that yeah. now 2018 yeah. it all clicks it's been a bit of a tease for the D supporters the last few years and then it all comes together have a really good season win finals go over to Perth to play in a prelim the prelim itself didn't go to plan but what was it like the lead up to that thinking this has all come together and the excitement that was generated by all the supporters yeah it was good we were, we were on a run like we'd 
we probably realised we were overachieving for that year. Like it was all probably coming a bit sooner than we thought. But um, I mean, you don't think that in the moment. You just keep going. What what can what can we do here? Um, we obviously got a fair wake up call in Perth in that prelim where I still yeah they were just fresh, quick, strong. Just beat us in the first fifteen minutes, just about, and the game was done. And crowd was obviously just fully supporting them over in West Coast. So we just yeah probably set the scene for the Melbourne boys that came back. Um, a couple of years later for that next final series last year, but um, good how, year. How many do you reckon played in that game that went on and played in the grand final a few years later? I reckon, do you reckon half? I reckon 10 to 12 yeah. would be my guess. I don't know the number. And you're, um, you're bottling up that feeling because mm. there's nothing but bad memories, you know, because no one likes losing. You, you want to make the finals and then to lose, you know, and especially over there, I don't know, it's like a tidal wave. If they get a bit of momentum in the crowd, it's... It's a great way to describe it's it. Like you, yeah. you need your shields up. You yeah. need to, you know, just well, just hang in there. And it, it just was a disaster. Well, I remember even Geordie Lewis, who was our most senior player, we were all hanging on to every word he said around that final series just because he'd been there and done that. I remember even he looked a bit rattled out there in that prelim just where he made a couple of mistakes or gave away a couple of silly frees just trying to impose himself. And I just thought, oh, well, look, you know, usually Louis super composed. Like, he does get the hot streak, mm. but he... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought, geez, Louis making a few mistakes. He were probably under the pump because he's our guy that we've all been leaning on throughout this whole final series. But looking back on 2018, it was a wonderful season and you must have a lot of fond memories from it. It was great. Yeah, I was in and out of the team a bit that year. So I was sort of a little bit worried about my personal performance more than enjoying, not more than, but it was biting into how much I could enjoy the team performance. Um, so I was sort of, oh, geez, am I getting squeezed out here? I was doing the math at times, which does get a bit draining, but... I remember we won that first final against uh, Geelong, about 90,000 there. That was fifth first eight, eighth at the G. Then we backed up and beat Hawthorne, who was, had been top four. We beat them. And then that was a great couple of weeks where you go, oh, you know, we're on a run here. Maybe we can go all the way. Like you, you dare to dream a little bit. But um, yeah, for me, I was sort of, sort of the first time I'd started to get dropped in my time at Melbourne. I was in and out a little bit. So it was almost like, oh, geez, I just want to play well here before I start thinking about the bigger picture with the team performance. And, and was the team fairly settled or was there probably, you know, half the team in that position where they're like, you know, a bad game here and there could be a little bit dicey? We were pretty healthy. So I think a few guys were on the edge yeah. a little bit. Look, I, I played, I think, 17 or 18 in the ones that year still. And I was I think I played seven in the two. So two out of three, I was generally in the ones. But... We did, uh, yeah, we did have a few where um, there were some young guys getting a little bit tired and some, you know, Bernie Vince was coming back off injury and we thought, oh, good, he might play Bernie and he might sneak onto the spot I'm in here as a sort of seniorish guy around there. But, um, yeah, it was sort of, you don't try to get too caught up in it, but it's almost in the back of your mind at times yeah. that you're sort yeah. of like, geez, geez, team's going well, wouldn't mind just making sure I'm part of this. <laughs> and after 94 games for Melbourne, that prelim would be your last for the... Blue and red. What happened after that game? Yeah, we got smoked and then we flew home in business class because they tried to look after us in case we were playing in the granny. And then <laughs> I think we all went to James Harm's house and had a lot of drinks. And then we rolled into the VFL. Who they, they were playing in a grand final, actually, at Marvel Stadium. So we watched that and then you sort of go, I better just wrap up a bit here in case, because I had my exit meeting the next day. And I sort of thought, oh, I don't know how it's going to go. So you sort of wrap up, get yourself fresh enough for the exit meeting and then... When I walked in, it was just the list manager and Goody. So there wasn't your midfield coach or a couple of assistant coaches. I thought, oh, this one's probably not going to be a pure um, season performance review here. And it was sort of straight into, I still had a year left on my contract. And they sort of said, oh, look, you can sort of tell you're getting edged out here. You're definitely not an inside mid for us anymore. Viney, Clayton Oliver, um, Angus Brayshaw. Petraka wasn't even playing midfield then. He was half forward, so... Um, he's turned out to be okay in the midfield. Oh, yeah, you, they, I think he gets. They find a spot for him these days, don't they? And then they said, "Oh, look, you're playing on the wing. You're probably not with the running capacity. We don't think you've quite got to be that really good week in, week out wingman, wingman for us. Um, we might even go down a recruiting model where we're going to target some pretty established wingmen. We're just giving you a heads up. You've got a bit of currency. If you want to explore, we'd give you the green light to go do that. So, I guess I'd." little bit of power where I still had a contract so if something didn't fit right or there wasn't anything too appealing on the table I could always come back to Melbourne and you know still fight hard to for that spot but the north offer popped up um they sort of promised me a bit more inside mid-time or just be back in that rotation where I'm, I'm at least in there a little bit and then they just said look 
Um, we're still competing. We feel like we've got a chance. We're going to top up with a few guys, um, come across, and we'll, we'll back you in. So in those conversations, which you've got to respect the honesty, you, you know, do, so, yeah. and, and I don't know how you feel about it now, but when you when you when your season's just finished and then you're sitting there and then they're having an honest appraisal of what they're thinking and, and the way they want to move forward, yet they're still trying to be respectful enough, but they're trying to be honest and up front because uh, I'm sure they respect um, you and the way that you went about it. It's, yeah, so how do you look at it now? Do you, do you think, you know, I'm glad that they didn't, bullshit me around I'm, I'm glad they told me how it was and at least gave me an opportunity to go okay do you know what when they're thinking like that it's going to be hard for me to be in all the time unless you know unless someone has a severe injury mm. and then I can just slot in and keep that spot for the rest of the year yeah too well definitely I did appreciate the honesty because you'd hate to get a little bit blindsided then you're stuck in the twos for a whole year there's been plenty of, that have been blindsided correct and then your day. currency's down and that next deal might not have been too attractive um, and you, yeah, as I said, lost a bit of currency. But looking back, I think it was either my manager or one of the other boys. They said, "Oh, you know, I, th- I think they were still pretty keen on Josh Kelly at the time, and might even have been Christian Salem." So, oh yeah, like they were, they were mates, and he's like, "Oh yeah, they always ask me about Cal's, and he's a wingman." And then I think even my manager said, "Oh, like they're, I think they might even be trying to get Andrew Gaff." And I'm thinking, "Well, there's two pretty good wingmen. Mm. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to match up against those boys. And if they're brought across, obviously they're going to get backed in and they're good players. So I sort of thought, well, if that does happen, even if it's in the year, you know, this year or the next year, like it, probably this is your time to explore and use the fact that you do have a little bit of currency still out there. So, yeah, looking back, um, definitely the right call for me personally, professionally, to make a call and, and go to another club. Before even we though, talk... Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, even though they go on to win a flag in a couple of years' time <laughs> Doubt I would have been in that team. Before we go on and talk about your North career, let's talk about the injuries because unfortunately we can't talk about your career without it coming up. You played 113 games, which is terrific, but with even luck it would have been double and maybe more than that. When did it start? And the unique thing is they were so different and so unique and it wasn't like they were related to each other. Yeah, I had a few different injuries. Like I had a shoulder reconstruction early at North, a lot of calf strains. I had this reoccurring sort of tendon strain in my calf, which... Did you do calves, Croft, at all? Or? I've never done a calf, but yeah. you know, a lot of my teammates that have done have recurring calf injuries, and yeah. they just they can't explain or fix. Well, and, and even now, like in their in mid forties, they can't run. Yeah, like they even want to go for a run with their kids, they can't even run two hundred meters without their calves becoming so tight. And it's, you know, it's crippling. It is. Well, yeah. I remember I did them and they were sort of those pretty strong grabs and a little bit of a pop that you feel. Um, two or three days later, you feel fine. You feel like you could go for a run and mm. you be, you go looking for where that soreness is. And, um, you know, the physios and the docs, oh, it's, you know, you got a grade two or three strain in your calf and there's a little bit of bleeding through the tendon there. So you're probably looking like a 10 to 12 week injury. Um and then you sort of hit, I remember the first time I did it, I probably hit six weeks and I go, I feel great here. Like you've got to, like another four or five weeks I'm out. Um, and I tried to push it a little bit at training and then that's when you get another grab and then you're back to square one. So the other t- couple of times I did do my calf, I did make sure I took my time to get it right. But um, just little things burn you where you, um, you got to be really strict with your recovery process, rehab where, you know, if you're running Monday, Thursday, Saturday, then keep it that way don't push it where you back up on a day or two's break less or something like that so or change grounds too often or even check your footwear which wasn't great for the yeah, old man get the deodoras on i think i yeah <laughs> I, I snuck into those asics sort of half boots yeah. half shoes for a little while and i had to break him the news one day which was a hard conversation but he took it well um but it, even when you're injured like it, I think in the AFL world, when you're injured, and it might be better these days with football clubs the way they do it, but it's the loneliest place. Like When you're out and you're not training with the, the players, you're not part of a lot of the meetings, you're doing your rehab, and rehab's changing different people all the time because some are back into the football flow and, and others aren't and others are on the long term. It's lonely. Like, you know, players just used to sit there on the grinder, you know, with their upper body or sit there on the bike and... It, it mentally is really, really difficult and it's very hard for football clubs to still try and keep those injured players involved and it's a real, like if they can get that perfect formula where they allow those players to somehow still feel like they're contributing and involved, 
amazing, but it doesn't feel like that because all you want to do is get out there and play and show what you can do and contribute. Yeah, well, I guess as a footballer, you're naturally competitive and probably a little bit impatient. That's generally the makeup. So when you're getting told you've got to be patient here and you don't get a chance to compete, those things are taken away from you. So, you, yeah, it does get draining. But um, looking back on it for me, I, I had my clutch and co started to kick in so I could lean back on the fact I'm trying to grow a small business here and I was also um, still at uni sort of doing like part-time study so I sort of had enough off field yeah, roles. Great distraction. Great distractions which is the word like um, you end up it became passion so I could sort of which wouldn't have happened probably as quickly mm. if there weren't the injuries like I probably wouldn't have got my degree finished by the time I finished footy or you know been able to step into pretty much full-time work with my small business that I was able to grow on the back of some more time availability due to injuries. What's harder, the mental or physical side of the recovery? Oh, it's a tough one because um, you physically feel pretty good. Uh, uh, you know, pretty soon after the injury, you just got to give it time. I guess mentally, uh, you got a lot of people checking in. You know, how's your injury? Where you at? And it does get repetitive explaining. You know, I'm a couple of weeks away if all things go well. And you know, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And this is what actually happened. So. You have the same conversation a fair bit of time, but it's just people coming from a good place. So you can't blame them for asking. I think, yeah, Croft hit it on the head before. Like footy clubs, you do get a bit isolated in that rehab um, cycle. So if you're stuck in there for a long term, um, probably the mental side of it does. does. And we were up in hubs. Um, COVID hit where a couple of times I was stuck, not really looking like I'm close to footy here and I'm sort of, um, yeah, up, up in a hub, sort of not sure exactly where I'm at. Well, you go to North. What was it like going from Melbourne to North Melbourne? And what was sort of some of the differences you noticed between the two clubs? Yeah, oh, they're all pretty similar. Like um, everyone's trying to do the same thing and find that competitive advantage with training standards and facilities and, you know, way that you even conduct meetings. But I do remember Brad Scott was... Um, the, the group was a bit more mature. Like, I feel like, you know, they really lent on guys like Sean Higgins and uh, Scotty Thompson and uh, um, Zeeble and Cunners. And Brad would always sort of not refer to them, but just throw it to them for some decision making. And um, yeah, it was almost like, oh, yeah, the, the players have a fair bit of say here. A like, bit of a players led club. I felt that at the time. And then, um, but that only lasted for half a season before Brad um, moved on. So then Shorey came in and, um, yeah, we sort of. Pl- we actually won a fair few games under Shorey early days in that caretaker role. Um, and then obviously COVID hit. So it's, it's, it was, um, yeah, everything was just different. The whole landscape changed across the board for everyone. It's, it's an, when you mentioned um, Reese Shaw, it's like you forget, oh yeah, he, he stepped in and took over as coach, but you, it just shows you how mentally challenging the game can be as a player, as a coach, you know, being involved in football, the pressure that goes with it all. Um, and obviously someone who had injuries and you know that you're more than capable of being out there and mixing it, you know, like there's there's a lot of times where you do have low periods where you've got to put in uh, practices that allow you to come back up and get to, you know, a level where you can hopefully keep everything fairly level. Yep. And as you said, you had great distractions, but you would have played with players that, you know, you would have seen them very high after wins and then you could see them very low yep. and it's... And I think Mad Jack Daw was was he around yeah, when you were around yep, as well? Yep. So you would have we seen players over. that had really struggled. So it becomes a, a scary proposition when you know what they're actually feeling because they're actually telling you what's going on with their lives these days. Yep. Um, so how did you work through all that, and did you have any sort of issues that you had to really work through yourself? No, I, I was pretty pretty good. I, I sort of felt like I had a good support network the whole time, and um, had other things where I could really um, sink my teeth into, yeah. but. In saying that, that there are, there are a lot of safeguards at the club, clubs, club land these days, which which do a great job. Like there is a full time employee in sort of career and welfare, so they're they're doing all they can to touch base about your off field development. And then there's club psychs. Um, you get good external support through the AFLPA. Um, they've got a, a portal you can sort of anonymously check in with them, and you get some some help if you need it there. So. There are, there's still lots getting through the cracks. There, though, there are, though. There? Yeah, that, I was going to say, that was the, my follow-up. The, the there Reshaw are and Mad Jack, and then yeah. there's so many, and it's just that type of world we're in, unfortunately. It is yeah. definitely all-consuming, and then, I mean, the bare facts of it is it is a performance industry, so pressure creeps in when you're not performing, um, and it hits you hard, as you know. I think you said tidal wave before, referring to playing over in Perth. I guess 
it's tidal waves another way of describing how it all becomes just uh in your face aggressive and um yeah you definitely got to have some strategies to be able to deal with that yeah we, we had some players who had issues but the thing is we didn't know they were issues mm. until it, it was almost too late yeah, you know the, so um whereas i think football clubs these days and i'll see you're fresh out of it I think they're so much better placed at having these open conversations. Is that right? Conversations are a lot better. Um, player to player, a lot better. There's little care groups that are, have come in now. So you, you've got little WhatsApps that you're checking in with. Um, and to be honest, a lot of it is in place so that no one falls through the cracks. I think that's the aim at, at Clubland when there's some high-level strategy meetings on player welfare. It would be what can we do to make sure every player – feels valued, supported, um, we're checking in regularly, um, what are the warning signs? So I'm sure there's all sorts of things happening behind the scenes that are yep. that they're trying to do to make sure, you know, situations that unfortunately do pop up and they, you know, part of life, but they do pop up that they're minimised or mitigated as best as possible. Dom, after three years at North Melbourne where you played six games, unfortunately, due to injury, what was that final conversation like at the end of the 2021 season? Respectful, amicable, yeah. Nobes is a David Noble, really good operator. He's sort of been around the traps and in a lot of different roles at, um, in the footy department. So he was professional and, and Brady was as well. Um, and I was at a stage with my life and had awareness that it's it's not looking good. Like if I was in a list management position, I would have made, been making a call on myself as well. So um, I'd had a knee mini- I'd had a knee operation about a month out from the final game. So that was probably the emotional side of it. Hits you then when you go, all right, that's probably my last game as an AFL listed player or as it being on a list. And then it's just more of a formal conversation that happens with, with the uh, guys in that exit review meeting. And I was lucky enough where um, they sort of offered me the vet, the role that I'm in now, which is a playing assistant role at VFL level. So they sort of thought, um, with the way the footy department's going, how can we sort of create a role that probably adds a little bit of coaching and we still get bit of playing out of it so yeah by the end of that meeting they sort of thought you know let the dust settle but we just wanted to float this out here and we'll touch base with you in a couple of weeks and just see where you sit on all of it. Now obviously that's just a great reflection on you as a player a person but also how you handled everything where they'd even think that this guy we're not going to push him out the door we're going to give him this. Yeah it was yeah it was a good surprise because um they sort of said to me initially, oh, do you think you could still play footy anywhere? And I thought, oh, look, when I did play at even VFL level, I thought I was pretty good. Like I um, knew that probably physically I wasn't up to it at AFL level anymore, but my VFL games still were good and they sort of jumped on it from there. So I've sort of prompted them into it, but um, they just said, oh, look, we we need some more experience at VFL level and if you're interested in coaching, we could maybe tie something together there. So, um, And yeah, I was obviously um, probably different with Croft because he retired on his own terms after big career but the the phone does run pretty hot after your <laughs> late 20s and there's a lot of uh, opportunities at local level and country level and amateur footy so I thought oh, I'll just keep the phone on and just see what pops up and then I mean you do a few of those meetings and um yeah the like they sound good, but then you're like, geez, I've got to travel a fair bit there. Or, um, yeah, or well, you do your real research yeah. and go, hey, that hasn't been like that at that club ever, you yeah. know. So, you, you do need the right people yeah. pushing you in the right direction, yeah. But it all, yeah, look, after a few phone calls, I thought, look, I'd just love to commit through to North at VFL level and um, have that wrapped up and, and kick on in that direction. This all sounds simplistic. What's the biggest difference between VFL footy and AFL footy? It's a good question. Um, First training drill at VFL level. I remember getting there for pre-season. Doing uh, circle work? <laughs> it was a kicking drill, honestly. It was, was it? <laughs> just more... It was pretty basic, but just a bit more than circle yeah, work. Yeah. We're going around. But yep. It was a 45 kick with another outward kick. Yep. And I reckon we missed the first 10 kicks. Yep. VFL level. And I thought, oh, we're going to get called in here. We're going to cop a spray. We've just wasted 10 minutes of training. Where's the energy? Where's the intensity? Who's correcting the drill? We didn't get called in. Yep. We just kept on doing the kicking drill and st- suddenly the boys started hitting a few <laughs> kicks and everyone started going, good kick. And yep. I remember after the session, I was said to the head coach, I was like, mate, geez, we started pretty poorly. He's like, well, mate, the boys have just come from work. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, like, because oh, he's uh, at the AFL full-time for development, Lee Adams, and he's like, mate, I just came out of meeting myself. I needed 10 minutes to get going too, just to get the eyes going. So I thought it... Sort of thought, geez, it's yeah. just a bit more relaxing. But it's a pressure. good attitude to have, you know, because you, it's like, hey, there's AFL level where you're expecting even your warm ups to be perfect. Whereas, you know, yeah, that, that's that's life. We all take a, a bit of warming up, but when we're on, we're on. Away yeah. we go. 
Yeah, well, I guess at AFL, the coaches always say you're a 24-7 athlete, so you shouldn't waste a minute, make the most of everything. So if you do start training poorly, 95% of the time you're getting called in and you're getting a little verbal just about, you got to lift here, lads. You, you performance on the weekend is reflected by how you train so if you train at shit house you're going to play shit house but yeah vfold there's um more factors at play so if, yeah, if someone's it's in the real world yeah it like is. everyone so lives in the real we've world got, we've got tradies we've got guys that are doing some sales rep roles in cars we've got mm. uni students um guys that are driving an hour and a half to get to training just from where they live so yeah, you can't expect too much out of them or else they're just not going to come back the next session. No, you've got guys working on farms that are driving headers all through the night Yep, and then driving down to play VFL footy. Like yeah. it's at, at a financial opportunity cost to local because yeah. they probably could have got paid yeah. more yeah. back at their local team. So you sort of, you got to give them some value at some some level and whether that's all right, well, your chance to play at the highest level possible is a, you know, is if it's VFL, then we'll support you and try and make you a VFL quality player. What does the future hold for Dom? Um, not sure. Just AFL coach? No, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> too smart. No, nah, I just uh, all that vision. I, I haven't really enjoyed. You I, don't have to watch all that. Vision. Yeah, you probably don't. Do you keep it more personal, face to face? You watch more vision, it gets harder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not sure. I'll, I'll, I'm in a level two coaching course, so I'll make sure I finish that just to give me options. But I'd love to say that you know my business is growing and things are going really well. Where um, to go be an AFL coach would be selling myself short and the business short because things are growing there. So that's the pipeline dream and I'm working hard to try and make sure it's a reality. Let's look back on some positives. Some of your AFL footy highlights. Um, yeah, first win at the Giants. First game up there. Um, probably at Melbourne, just when we're starting to grow, when you played really well in a win, you just have a nice buzz of a adrenaline and a high there. Um, 100th game, we won that over in Adelaide. It was actually... Jordan Lewis is 300, so that was a bit of a celebration there. Um, and they were, yeah, probably the main ones. What about um, if you had to do a top three players that you played with? Yep. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Because you've got the Giants, North Melbourne, and then you've got, obviously, the Demons. Um, some very, very good players. Oh, uh, it's probably Petraka, number one. Really? You could see it, you yeah. Could, you could see it. The yeah. way I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how you gauge it, but when I look at best players, I go, can they do something that I've just never done? And Petraka does that daily. He just does things I'm never, ever going to be able to do. So I go, he's special. Whereas a lot of guys, you go, oh, he just he's just so fit, works really hard, and um, he's a gun because of that. And then there's the athletic gun. So Track's probably the athletic gun, and now he's brought the work rate. So he's doing things out there. You're going, wow. And then he does it again and again. Yeah. Right? Whereas when I was probably early days at Melbourne, he'd do it once or twice a game. Now it's 10 to 12. He's um, unstoppable. He's unstoppable. Can't he tackle him. Kicks goals from yep. positions where not many would probably have a shot, but he, he does and he kicks them. I got crucified, I think, on this show. Was it on this show a few years ago? It was. Yep. I said, oh, I think Petraka is going to go past Dusty. Or he's gone past him in the last six games, you know, and that yep. was when Dusty was flying. And Dusty's a superstar and yep. he's still ahead because of what he's done Body and the premierships. Work. Yeah, but... I got smashed. I think Mark Robinson wrote an article about it saying, right. oh, you know, and then it just threw it out there. And But I'll tell you what, he hasn't let me down, the boy. He's a gun. <laughs> he's, he's, come a gun. With, he's come with a <laughs> yeah. bullet. Yeah. He's just, uh, he's a freak. He is unstoppable. Even yeah. his goal on the weekend, which wasn't awarded, that snap, you can't snap a ball like that from what that it, far out yeah. and to do what it did. No one can do that. Like, you, you can't do that with that distance and and. The airspace that it had yeah. and it covered and the way it turned, he, he's a freak. He's a freak. Um, yeah. Jeremy Cameron's up there too. He was early yeah. days at the Giants where I just thought, I think he might have kicked six, 60 or 70 goals in that second year when we weren't even getting much supply, forward 50, or probably wasn't coming in with great quality and he was just making every half chance a goal. And was, was he a good natural runner? He was. He was. He was. He had athleticism. Yeah, um, yeah he was. He, he wasn't winning the running, but um, for a Six foot six bike. He was, yep. you, yeah. He stood out with his running capacity. Um, not speed, more just that high intensity. Yep. Could go again, repeat effort stuff. Um, and then one that might surprise you, but probably Benny Cunnington. Yeah, I'm glad you said him yeah. because I was going to ask you about him before. But yeah, he's a ripper. Like he, he is a, just a contested ball king. And it probably and takes. He was you, almost unstoppable yep. at his very best as well. Yeah, he probably takes you until you're in the building to realise all the little things he does. And it just seems he's, like he can't run. He's he's quick over the first five meters, and then yep. uh, like 
he's yeah. powerful and quick. But he, he doesn't need to run because he's winning it. Yeah, the- and he's very smart with his <laughs> angles. So, yes. I mean, if there is a bit of play where he's got to absolutely sprint out to the wing to create an option, you won't see him doing that too often because it probably cooks him for the next yeah. passage of play. So he s- stays in his little corridor lane and sort of controls the game in that way. But um, just at training and even games, he puts himself in that midfield slot go-to position yeah. and he doesn't care if you're on his back. He just goes, nah, he try and it. tackle me. Imagine Petraka and Cunnington at their best Physically playing on each other around yeah. a stoppage. Like, in that. now that would be good. Yeah, if you gave him a little radius of yep. three to five metres, that would be great to watch. But I think, obviously, if it spills out, track's going to... It'd be like a match race. It. You just yeah. want to go and they're going to have <laughs> yeah. 30 throw-ins <laughs> and, you know, 20 ball-ups yeah. and just watch those two smash at each other. Yeah, it'd be great. That would be pretty special. Yeah. Good betting contest as well. We can have some fun with that one. Mate, it's not all about betting, Quinny. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have a little each way. <laughs> if you were to meet a top five draft prospect, what advice would you give them? Um, great question. Uh, you can still be patient. Like They come in all guns blazing these days, which is great. But um, just be patient. Like You're going to have good games and bad games. And um, your bad games are never as bad as you think they are. Like You'll be fine. Keep backing yourself in. Keep bringing your attributes. Um, and just ride, ride with the... Keep yourself even, which is what Croft's touched on. Sort of not too high, not too low. Just ride with the punches and keep bringing your attributes. Would, would you ever consider... Managing, um, management. Oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think you'd be very good at that. Um, you've just got a good view of the world. Maybe you've yeah. been in amongst. You might be too nice. Not. Might be the maybe. problem. No, I don't think. He, well, he is very nice, yeah, but too nice. He's, he's had plenty of those open and honest conversations. Yeah. So you know, he's going to tell it how it is. Um, I don't know. That's a space. What's your dream? Oh. What's your dream job? Like, if there's a job out there, mm. you know, you, you've gone on. To study and mm. you know you, you've yeah. got a commerce tick, degree, tick, tick, so business yeah. degree. So, yeah. is it, what is your real passion? What makes you jump out of bed? Well, Going did, to the well, masters. Uh, didn't um? Did Gil just resign? Did that? Yeah. Happen? There we go. Why would you put yourself there? We go. That? You get hammered. <laughs> There's the headline. <laughs> um, no, I'm not sure. Not sure. Just I'll take take the next twelve months to find my feet, grow my business, yep. get a taste of coaching, um, and yeah, I, I mean opportunities pop up where you ten years ago. Running an e-commerce business probably is mm-hmm. didn't exist. Now you can do it. So maybe in ten years' time, there's a job out there that doesn't even exist, and it's something you might be doing. So I'm not sure. I don't want to uh, put a ceiling on what it might be, or sort of be too nah, rigid. No, You're not even thirty yet, are you? No, I'm 28. So Jeez, that's a bit depressing, isn't yeah, it? How yeah. young he is? 28, and sort of having an idea of the direction you want to go. You Far know, too sensible in this room. You're not locking yourself <laughs> in. It's like keep the gate open. Best, gate open. Best sled you ever heard on a footy field. Yeah, not necess- yeah, it's a sledge, I guess. It's Sammy Mitchell, um, my first year at Melbourne, 2014, Hawks were absolutely humming. And um, he was going really well. And Ruzi said to me, you're going to run with Ru- Sammy Mitchell. Like, um, put a lot of time into him. Don't let him get off the chain. Um, and we're on the wing. Um, and I reckon there was a half-backer for Hawthorne free. And you could see the ball shaping towards his half-backer. It might have been Birchall. And Mitchell's next to me. I'm trying to have a little forearm on him for a bit of body. And he goes, you're going to press? He's just talking to me. And he's like, the ball's coming here. You're going to press? <laughs> and I sort of looked at him and I was like, no, no, no. I've been told to stay with you, mate. <laughs> and then he looked at me. He goes, you're not going to go here. Look, look, it's gonna, it's, he's going to get it in about three seconds. You're not going to go? And then I went, no, nah, no, nah, I'm staying with you. And then he goes, well, that's why your club's been shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and then that was it. It was like a, it was like a bit of a coaching experience. So I think next time I pressed <laughs> and went up and left him, and he got the ball. So he, he had yeah, a no, motivation he, to he it. He knows yeah. exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Sorry about that, but yeah. you know um, that's funny you say that because he's that that's the way he was. You yeah. know, you have a little conversation with you when he's playing, and then yeah, it gets you second guessing yourself. Yeah, but he, he he's the one that you know if you did a couple of laps endurance wise. <laughs> You'd go, I got him covered, but somehow on a footy field, a bit like at Cunnington, they got all the angles. They yep. get to the right spots, and before you know it, they've had forty touches. Yeah, You're thinking, oh my goodness, how's he had forty touches? And it's all that stoppage work. You Definitely. know, somehow they get their hands on it, even though you're all over them, and not only feed it off, they feed it off perfectly. Yep, they're never out of play. So even Scotty Pendlebury does it, where they'll 
they'll just keep themselves in that sort of contest line and they're just always within a kick, kick and a half. And if the ball spills that way, they're there and um, they just read the play so smart, definitely. Do you know, he, he's, he's Sam Mitchell's trick towards the end of his career because um, around a stoppage, everyone gets it, you know, centre bounce, everyone gets the ball and they charge off towards their goal. So he used to get the ball, charge off towards his goal, take two steps and then stop. Little hit up kick. No, no, just stop. So he's got the ball. Yeah. So everyone charges forward. So then he's got all this space to work out what to do. Right. Oh, because so he's it, got the ball. Gotcha. Yeah, so yeah, he, yeah, he's sorry. got the footy. Yeah. Takes a couple of steps towards his goal, stops, everyone charges forward, and then he has an extra second or two to go, I'll, I'll ping it off, and away he goes. Yeah. So he, he was always a step ahead because you think about it, someone gets the footy, they want to charge towards goal. Um, he was like, well, I'll just stop. Yeah. He's he like, no, no, we don't, that's not what we're doing over footy. No one stops. He goes, yeah, I stop he was, because it gives me more time. He was probably the first, and we started training it. Um, you take a mark in general play. What are you told to do? Push back off the mark. Don't, you know, give yourself some space. He was probably the first guy to sort of only take that step or two back mm-hmm. and then just either go left or right for that little 15-metre yep. progression kick. So I think we, you know, had a drill called the face-up Sam Mitchell kick where you literally mark it. You don't play on but you don't go back off the mark. So, yeah, he was just super smart. But it, it, even like um, Alistair Clarkson, prior to that, was like, if you've got the ball cross half back with a wing, um, you know, come back and then normally come back six or seven metres and then come back another six or seven metres and then just hook it. Yeah. Away you go, start running because you've already given yourself 15 metres of space and normally everyone's pushed down the field. Yeah. And then you can run off. And then as the flow happens, everyone starts to run off and create space and options. And it away you shift, go. Shifted the defence a little so, bit. Yeah. So, so I think that's why Sammy got yeah. Clarko sacked. He said, no, 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 we're going to do things a bit differently now. So that's the way they've <laughs> You're going to create it. headlines again. <laughs> You've been mischievous. Yeah. There's the clip. <laughs> Former Hawthorne, great. That's not true. Yeah, it's it, what, the uh, former Hawthorne great or the no, they've got no, no, no. <laughs> it's all true, but it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll the save, they we'll do save this podcast before he gets himself <laughs> in trouble here, Dom. Best spray you ever heard from a coach? Oh yeah, Bruzy gave out some great sarcastic dry sprays. Um, one rings well, one that I can think of right now up in Darwin or Alice Springs. We're playing Port Adelaide. We we're down within a goal minute or two left and we had a kick out uh, and it was Lyndon Dunn who could put the foot into it and he's you know to play you know, up the middle kick it for distance and he's hard position playing in the back line yeah. you make one mistake you look like a, a goose correct he's he's gone for the torp oh, um, no. and it's slippery up there too yeah, doesn't it like sweat. it dew yeah. And sl- yeah, sweat. he got enough of it but it, um, like a, no, it wasn't perfectly spiralled and it didn't go 80 metres. And but his teammates probably didn't even know who was going to do it. You've beat me to it. So. it. It wasn't part of the game plan. So we, we hit the, um, yeah, they've marked it straight back in, kick a goal. They win by 10 points. So we must have been down by four at that stage, something like that. And we get into the change rooms and Ruzi's there. And Where's Dunny? Dunny, where are you, mate? Well, there you are, yeah. yeah. Talk. Yeah, got a, bit, got a bit of it, yeah, yeah. I, you know, grandparents, pretty proud of you. Hit a torp, yeah, yeah. Anyone else, anyone else knew Dunny was going to kick a torp? Ruckman, where, were you in the middle ready for Dunny? No, no. Where was that in the game plan, Dunny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Running your own show and, um, yeah, that was a good one. And then he used to just, yeah, Rosie would just sort of chip away like that. He'd sort of go, oh, yeah, you have a shot when you probably should have passed it, you know, parents in the paper for a goal, good on you, you know, did it help the team and things like that. So he'd sort yeah. of, yeah, a lot of a lot of rusy ones like that. You ever cop any off him? Yeah, a few, yeah. Um, oh, what was some of mine? mine it might have been about I didn't run defensively with a bloke and, um, I, you know, cheated a bit of an offensive angle and he sort of, yeah, you do want to be a two-way player. Dan Hannabury runs both ways. He's a gun. Do you want to be like Dan or what's going on? Sort of things like that. He used to reference Hanover's running power a lot for, you know, me and Jack Viney, young mids at the time. <laughs> He's too you needed good. to pull yeah. the videos out and yeah. say, yeah, Rusey, can you tell me about your defensive running here? <laughs> yeah. um, you're trying to rack up another touch. Yeah. He'll come for you, Crawford. Yeah. Dom Tyson, it's been an absolute pleasure. 113 games. Well done on a magnificent career and all the best going forward. Thanks, Quinny. Thanks, Craw. Thanks for having me on. Good on you, Dom. 